Facebook Live. From Medina. At the hardware store. At Ace Hardware. Yep. We, they got good <laughs> internet here. In their parking lot. In the parking lot. <laughs> Watching all the world go around us. Yep. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Yes. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Oh, I'm blessed. Yes. Yes, I'm very blessed. It's good to have you with us for Bible study. Yes. Yes. I your notes here. I yep. got all the secrets. Oh, there, there's no secrets. I got no secrets with you. <laughs> <laughs> My life is an open book to you. <laughs> yep. Hey, would you like to ask any questions? Um, how are you? How's your Sabbath? What's your social security number? Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm pretty good. I'm pretty, I'll tell you all that stuff later. <laughs> we got a Bible study. I see my mom's here. We know others are coming. So, hello, Mom. Hello, Cindy. Hello, Dolores, Ed, Felicia, Emily, Brother Joe, Brother Don, Brother David. Oh, we love all y'all. Keely, we appreciate all your time. Oh, Jay, Clarissa, they're a little cutie. Mm. Yes, yes. Thank y'all for coming. Thanks for joining us for the Bible study. Today we're going to talk about God's nonviolent character. Okay. That can be a radical shift for somebody, but my uh, brother Don is here. Good to see you, brother Don. God bless you. Okay, so I say we pray and get on the road. All right, let's pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessings of the Sabbath, which we get to celebrate your love in the beauty of creation. We thank you, Lord, for all the people that are coming or will come and Lord, as we pray, we thank you for forgiving us of our sins. We thank you for blessing us with your righteousness. And we thank you for the indwelling spirit so that we can overcome sin, self, Satan, and the world. As we pray, Heavenly Father, we ask to serve others and to serve you. And we can't do that without you equipping us with the spirit. So we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would pour your spirit of truth and love into us as a river that you would speak through us and help us to see your character as nonviolent throughout the whole Bible. So, Heavenly Father, as we believe, trust, and have faith in you, we thank you for your blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, well, I love y'all. Thanks for coming. Good to see you, Kathy. Good to see everybody. And so, of course, I'm going to ask my wife for the Bible. Okay. She's grabbing it for me. And I got my Bible. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. To understand God, we have to receive the Spirit of God so that we can understand His character, His methods, and His principles. Psalm 18, verse 30 says that God is perfect. And Malachi chapter 3, verse 6 says that God is unchangeable. So God's love has to be perfect and unchangeable. And when it says that God is love, that means the core essence of who God is, is love. It doesn't say he has it. It doesn't say that God can use love when he wants to and don't use it when he doesn't want to. It says that God is love. That means everything that God does in character, method, and principle stems from the central core essence of who he is, that God is love. Of course, we have our three Bible study core principles. We use these all the time. This is eating from the tree of life. Bible study principle number one. Uh, God is love. God is agape. What that means when you look at 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 7, juice that down. We see God is perfect self-control. We see that God considers all creation more important than he considers himself. And that God is not personally offended by our sins. Again, 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 7. Our second core Bible study principle is that the life of Christ is the ultimate revelation of the Father. John 14 9 says if you see me you see the Father. That's going to be an important facet of this Bible study. The third core principle we use is biblical principle explains the scripture and scripture explains biblical principle. Isaiah 28 10 for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. The three core biblical principles that we use to understand God in character, method, and principle is agape, it's design law, and it's the revelation of God and scripture through the two trees. 
And today we're going to use these principles to look at the nonviolent character of God. Now, for a lot of people in the world to say that God has a nonviolent character, that is a radical revelation. And not too many people can deal with that. But if I'm asking you to have patience in this Bible study so that we can look at God's nonviolent character. And of course, we're going to ask a couple questions to set the tone as we begin to look at Scripture. We're going to ask the question, why is it important to know what God is like? Right? Doesn't it just matter if I just believe in God? Isn't it good enough that I just believe in the God that the Bible tells me about? Does it matter what we think about God, if he's violent or if he's not violent? Let's look at these two passages. Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23. Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23 says this, Thus saith the Lord, that's the true God, the one true God, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might, let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord which exercises loving kindness judgment righteousness in the earth for in these things i delight saith the lord so god calls all of humanity to get to understand and know him on an intimate level john 17 3 john 17 3 says this and this is eternal life now when we think about eternal life and how we understand it does it match up with what comes out of the mouth of jesus this is Jesus speaking here, John 17, 3, And this is eternal life, that they might know thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So understanding God, knowing what he's like, is really the foundation of anything that's worth knowing. Knowing God explains life. Knowing God explains the Bible. It explains sin. It explains the battle between truth and lies, between Jesus and Satan. Knowing God who he truly is, is literally the difference between life and life and death. Because if eternal life is knowing God and his son, if that's eternal life, then what is eternal death? It's not knowing God. It's not knowing the son. So knowing God for who he truly is, is very important. Because we want to trust God. We want to believe God. We want to have faith in God. Right? And so as we do that, it's our trust, our belief, and our faith only get cemented deeper and deeper as we get to know him on deeper and deeper levels. And the more we get to know about God, the more healing there is. And the more, the more we get to know God, the more life-giving principle is associated with us because knowing God is eternal life. So what we believe about God and his character, this di directly affects our character. What we know and believe about God determines what our character is actually like. And to God, there's nothing more important than how our character develops. Matthew chapter 8, verse 36. I'm sorry, Mark chapter 8, verse 36. Mark chapter 8, verse 36 says this. For whosoever will save his life... I'm sorry... Matthew 8, 36. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? So nothing is more valuable than the character that we develop. This is why God sent forth his Son to reveal the truth about God to us, so that as we behold him, we can become like him. John chapter 10, verse 30. John chapter 10 verse 30 says this I and my father are one what does that mean I and my father are one Jesus and the father are one in purpose one in character one in method one in principle they have a perfect relationship they're completely united and they're in harmony with everything that they do and what we end up seeing in Scripture is that they actually invite us into this union. They invite us into this relationship so that we, 
who have been divided from God through sin can come back into harmony with him and have a perfect relationship. John chapter 17, 20. John chapter 17, verse 20 says this, Neither I pray for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, are in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory, the character, which you give me, I give to them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and has loved them as thou hast loved me. God is calling us to a relationship with him, so that we can understand who he is in character, method, and principle, so that we can agree that this is the life principles that make life possible we can accept that and then he can strengthen us to begin to walk in that so that we can be in harmony with him in character and method and principle the same way that the father and son are as one in character this is what God is calling us to to be one with him as well so it's very important to understand what God is like and it's very important to understand is God violent is God a killer or is God nonviolent? Is God not a killer? That's very important. It's good to believe in God. It's good to believe in the God of the Bible. But the devils believe and tremble because even though they believe in God, they also will participate in the weeping and gnashing of teeth that takes place at the second death. So it's not just good enough to believe, oh, there's a God. It's the God of the Bible. What is he like in character and method and principle? Do we understand him? Or have we in, been infected with the lies of Satan? So the God that we believe in is directly connected to the character that we develop. Right? This is called the design law of worship. Worship is designed to give God praise and thanksgiving. Right? It's rightful to do that because he's the creator. He's our father. He loves us. But God didn't design worship to selfishly seek attention. There's a facet of worship which is for us. And that sounds crazy. This might be new to somebody. But the design law of worship is a life-giving principle that focuses our attention on the one thing that makes life possible, God. So worship is a life-giving principle that causes life to grow, to flourish into greater and greater realities as we behold the one true God. And as we think about worship, let's think about this. God, the creator, is infinite. And he created beings with infinite potential. That's what we are, the humans, the angels. We have infinite potential. So as an infinite God, created beings with infinite potential, he gives us worship to fix our attention on the thing that gives life the only possibility to blossom and bloom, his character. And as we behold his character, we grow in grace and truth, we flourish and blossom from image to image throughout all eternal ages. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says this, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. But we all, with open face, beholding in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of God. So as we behold God, as our attention is fixed upon him, we are changed into that same image from character development to character development through eternal ages. Now, this design law principle, this is not just, it cannot just be used in a positive way. God designed this for positivity, but Satan can use the same principle to degrade us and to bring us into his image and his character. Psalm 115, verse 7. Psalm 115, verse 7 says this. Let's go back a couple. Psalm 115, verse 4. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. They have eyes, but they see not. They have ears, 
but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. They that make them are like unto them. So is every one that trusts in them. What is an idol? An idol is a false idea about God. And when we behold false images of God, we become like those false images of God. So how we perceive God, how we view God, is extremely important because it affects every part of our life if we realize it or not. That's very important. How we view God affects every part of our life if we realize it or not. There's a biblical principle which says the name represents the character. 1 Samuel 25, 25. As his name is, so is he. That's important. Because Micah 4, 5 talks about this. Micah 4, 5 talks about the name of God and how we walk in it. Jonah, Micah. Micah chapter 4, verse 5. Micah 4, 5, for all people, for all people will walk everyone in the name of his God, and we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. So everyone walks in the name of their God, or everyone develops the character of their God. Everybody. If your God is the God of this world, you'll develop a worldly character. If your God is uh, the God of heaven and earth, then you'll develop that kind of character. And if we think that God uses violence on others, it doesn't matter if it's physical violence, verbal, emotional, psychological violence. If we think that God uses violence on others, we'll think it's okay to use those same forms of violence. This is why in the church, you see verbal, emotional, and psychological violence taking place because they worship a God who they think uses emotional, physical, psychological, and verbal violence against people. John 17, verse 3. John 17, verse 3. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, in Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Knowing God is eternal life. Knowing God reconciles us to him. Knowing God heals us. Knowing God gives us life and life eternal. That sounds funny. That might be new to a lot of people because the world says if you accept Jesus' death on the cross and the forgiveness of sin, that's eternal life. But that's not what the Bible says. Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 and 22. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father. I'm asking you to hear me out now because this is an important point. Jesus' death on the cross was not a sacrifice to make God love me. That's the pagan. That's pagan. That's not, that's not the truth. Jesus didn't have to die on the cross to make God love me. God already loved me. Jesus' death on the cross is a revelation of how much God loves me. That's very important. Check this out. Isaiah 53, 5. Isaiah 53 5 says this but he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities the chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed it does not say with his stripes we are forgiven it says with his stripes we are healed because as we view how much God loves us and what divinity is willing to go through to show us that love, that heals the mind. It doesn't say that with his stripes we are forgiven because long before Jesus died on the cross, our sins were forgiven. Now stick with me. This is a new idea. I get it. Isaiah 53 verse 4. Surely he bore our grief and carried our sorrows, yet we... Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. This whole idea that God sacrificed his only begotten son to forgive sinners, that's, that's our idea. That does not come from God. We think God killed him, but that's not the truth. 
The truth is, is that we killed Jesus. Sinful human beings killed Jesus. Sin killed Jesus, not God. As we look at the truth about what the cross really represents, it's a revelation of how divinity reacts under the most extreme pressure. Even the pressure of death, divinity under the most extreme, absolute worst conditions would rather die than use violence and take life. That's just a reality. Think about it. Under the worst conditions, divinity was kind. Divinity was patient. Divinity was not violent. Jesus never resisted those killing him. Jesus never passed judgment on those killing him. In fact, Jesus forgave those who were killing him. And if you look at the entire life of Christ up to and through the cross, it proves that God is a non-violent being. Because John 14, 9 says, If you see me, you see the Father. The entire life of Christ is a revelation of what God would do if he was here in Jesus' place. Jesus never killed. Jesus never hated. Jesus never condemned anybody. Jesus never used force, manipulation, or coercion. Jesus only gave life. Jesus only loved people, even the people that were killing him. Jesus only forgave. He only healed. He only restored. He only uplifted. Jesus fed the hungry. Jesus healed the sick. Jesus freely forgave people, even if those people didn't ask for forgiveness. That's a revelation. There are many people in the Bible who Jesus forgave and they didn't ask for it. The guy at uh, the pool of Bethesda, the woman caught in adultery. These are just a few examples of people Jesus forgiving when they didn't ask for it, right? And so you look at Jesus washing the people's feet, the people that betray him now. And when Jesus says, I and the Father are one, you see me, you see the Father. And then you know that God is a healer that he's a foot washer, that he eats with sinners because he loves them. They're his children. They're his sick children, but they are his children. Isaiah 53 verse 9 says this. Isaiah 53 9, And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was deceit in his mouth. Jesus had done no violence. And if you see Jesus, you see the Father. That means the Father hath not done any violence. Now the Bible might make us seem like God had done some violence. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But if we believe Jesus, the revelation of God, then we have to say that the Bible hath proven somehow, some way, that God hath never done any violence. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23. 2 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23 says this. Who when he was reviled, talking about Jesus. When Jesus was reviled, he reviled not. Again, when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to judge. To him that judges righteously. What does that word reviled mean? That word reviled means to hold in contempt, to have bitterness, to have hatred. And it says that Jesus did not revile those who were killing him. That means that God did not revile. God the Father did not hold those in contempt who were killing his own son. And again, Jesus says, if you see me, you see the Father. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 who being the brightness of his glory who being the brightness of his character and the exact express image of his person that's a replica of divinity and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had purged our sins sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high this verse says that Jesus is an exact replica of divinity right he's the exact revelation of God's character that's important. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. Listen to this now. 
in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine upon them. So Jesus is the gospel. He's the good news about what God is really like. That's important. And it says that Satan, the God of this world, blinds the minds to that fact. It says that we can't see the revelation of God's nonviolent character in the life of Christ because we're blinded by Satan. What is Satan's blindness? Where does it come from? Genesis chapter 2, 16. Genesis chapter 2, 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou hast made freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Notice it does not say that in the day that thou eatest thereof I will surely kill you. It says the day that you eat thereof you will surely die. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he, and, he, and he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God does know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. Ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eyes, a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. This is where the blindness of Satan comes from. It comes from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This is why we cannot see the nonviolent character of God. Right? And it's easy for us to understand why God put the tree of life in the midst of the garden. But why did God put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden? Did God do this on purpose so that he could set Adam and Eve up for a fall? He did not do that. If eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil would bring death, why didn't God just call it the tree of death? What is the knowledge of good and evil? These things are all important questions that we really need to understand so that we, as believers, can see a nonviolent character, so that we can divide the word of truth, and so that we can grow in deeper and deeper faith as we see the love of God displayed in the word. So, God is a God of love. And since God is the source of love, he understands what makes love love possible love to be love has to be freely given it has to be decided upon you cannot force love you cannot manipulate love you cannot coerce it because when that's the situation then love actually becomes slavery so love has to have the option not to love and God allowed this option to be placed in the garden God didn't make us slaves he said you can love me, you don't have to love me, right? And we see two trees in the garden. The tree of life represents God's love, God's character, God's methods, God's principles, the things that make life possible. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil symbolically represents the freedom not to love God. The, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil represents the choice not to follow God's character, its methods, and its principles. Life can only exist through the principles of love. This is not a threat. God didn't threaten them in the day that you eat thereof, I will kill you. God was explaining to you, 
Adam and Eve and to all of us that when we participate in the knowledge of the tree of good and evil, we're participating in a system that makes life impossible. There's love is the principle of agape. It's self-control. It's considering others more important than you consider yourself. It's not being personally offended when others do something that you don't like. This is actually how God's kingdom runs for eternity. It's so simple. Everybody in the kingdom of God will operate on self-control, on considering others more important than they consider yourself, and not being personally offended when somebody does something you don't like. This is love. This is agape juice down to a very simple understanding, right? And it's this, God's agape love that makes life possible. This is God's laws of love. This is the design law of love. This is what makes life possible. And all of this understanding is embodied in the tree of life. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil represents everything that makes life impossible. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil represents everything that makes life impossible. That means no self-control, complete selfishness, hatred, bitterness, and death. So we ask the question, what exactly is the knowledge of good and evil? Right? Is it just knowing about evil and doing it? Or is it something greater? And as we investigate this, we're going to see that this is Satan's counterfeit to righteousness. That this is actually a system of reward and punishment that Satan introduces into existence so that he can exalt his principle, his throne, above the throne of God. So the knowledge of good and evil is a system of reward and punishment. And it's a system of be good to the good with blessings and be evil to the evil with curses and punishment. This is not God's system. As we explain the system of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it's going to sound a lot like God's system. It has nothing to do with God's system. Satan has blinded the minds of the churches, and he has convinced them that his system is God's system. That's not God's system. This is God's, this is God's system. Matthew chapter 5, 44 and 45. Matthew chapter 5, 44 and 45. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be children of your Father which is in heaven. For he makes the sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. God's system is good both to the good and the evil. God loves the just and the unjust. He doesn't have a system of reward and punishment where he favors one group over another. If you look at 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, this is what it says. 1 John chapter 4, verse 18 says this. There is no fear in love, which means there's no fear in God. For perfect love casts out fear because fear hath torment. He that fears is not made perfect in love. Satan's system of reward and punishment of good and evil, of be good to the good with blessings and be evil to the evil with cursings, this is a system that causes fear in the mind. It's impossible to be God's system because God's system would never cause us to fear him because we're afraid he's going to punish us. Very important that the knowledge of the good and evil is Satan's system. It's not God's. And it's a system of iniquity. It's a system of reward and punishment. It's a system of corruption and competition. Because once you enter this system, this is what happens. You participate in this. You're now then shooting after the reward of blessings. And you're of trying to avoid the punishment. And it creates arrogance. It creates deception. It creates dishonesty. It creates delusion. It creates ego, envy, greed, hatred, selfishness, violence, immorality, and good works to earn reward. This is where all of the competition in the world comes from. It comes from the satanic system of good and evil. It uses manipulation, force, and coercion. And this is where violence has its core. Because in the system of good and evil, both the good and the evil use violence. That's, it's important to know that. 
The knowledge of good and evil pits every single person in this system against each other, fighting for first place, fighting to be the most loved, fighting to be the most blessed. And this is what Satan says in his system. He says the good in his system are only good if they follow the rules perfectly. That's what it says. And when you do that, it creates pride, selfishness, iniquity, and violence. How does being good in Satan's system create violence? Well, when you're good in Satan's system and you see the evil in that same system, you begin to use verbal violence. You begin to use manipulation, coercion, and force to draw them out of the evil side into the good side. So there's violence. If it's verbal, emotional, psychological violence, it's there, right? And Satan will deceive the good in his system by convincing them that if they don't do what, if they don't follow the rules perfectly, he'll punish them. He'll lock them up and eventually he'll use the death penalty on them. This, is, this, is, this sounds like God's system because we've been deceived into believing Satan's lies. But the good in Satan's system and the evil in Satan's system, it's actually the same thing. Because in Satan's system, the good will guilt the evil into following the rules. And they use violence, emotional, psychological, physical violence. It's been done throughout history. The evil in Satan's system are evil because they don't follow the rules. They become transgressors of the law and they condemn themselves and others. And they also use physical, emotional, verbal, and psychological violence. Both the good and the evil in Satan's system live in iniquity, which end up in death. Both the good and the evil in Satan's system live in iniquity and they end up in death. The good in Satan's system die because they don't live by the life-giving principle of agape. It's a subtle deception, right? It's a, it's a work of self-righteousness, which God calls iniquity. But in Satan's system, when we believe his lies, we think we're doing the right thing. But following rules does not create love. It does not do it. And if love is the design law of life, no rule following can ever create that in you. You need the spirit of love, which causes you to do no harm to your neighbor. And the evil in Satan's system die because they live outside of what makes life possible through open rebellion. So one is subtle deception and one is open rebellion. That's important to understand. The knowledge of good and evil is in every part of our society. Satan's system of good and evil is very deceptive because he convinces the world that this is God's system. That kind of sounds like it because our brains have been so inundated with lies, we think that God runs his universe with the principles of good and evil. He does not do it. Satan also convinces the evil that if they don't do the good in his system, that they're going to be punished. Eh, that sounds like God's system, but it's not. Satan tries to convince the evil in his system to do the good in his system. It's the same system. It's both iniquity. Both of these parts of his system end up in the second death. And Satan tells the good, if they follow the rules perfectly, they will be blessed and given eternal life. And this idea is so entrenched in the minds of humanity that even as I describe it, it sounds like God's system. But it is absolutely not God's system. Matthew 22, 9. Matthew 22, 9. Matthew 22, 9 says this. She's talking about the parable of the marriage of the king's son. Talking about the kingdom of God and who's in it. Matthew 22, 9. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find bid to the marriage. So those servants went out to the highways and gathered together as many as they found, both bad and good. And the wedding was furnished with guests. God's kingdom is for both the good and the bad. 
God loves everybody the same. And as we look at this next verse, Jesus is using a, an event that he went through to describe how he forgives everybody in Satan's system, both the good and the evil. Luke chapter 7, verse 40. Luke 7, 40. Luke 7, verse 40 says this. We're talking about the sinful woman and Simon the Pharisee. Uh, now when the Pharisee which had bidden Jesus saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have something to say to thee. He saith, Master, say on, There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. One owed five hundred pence, a lot of money, and the other owed fifty, a little. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou rightly judged. So Jesus gives a small story about somebody who owes a lot of money and somebody who owes a little money both of these represent sinners simon was the one who was represented as having a little sin and the woman is the person who's represented as having a lot of sin jesus is telling us that both are sinners this is an understanding of the good in satan's system and the evil in satan's system the good in satan's system have few sins the evil in Satan's system has many sins. But Jesus here says, I frankly forgive them both. 2 Corinthians 5.19 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19 says this, To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses, not imputing their sins against them and have committed unto us the word of reconciliation god forgives us all both the good and the evil in satan's system and it's the satanic system of good and evil that entered humanity which is calling all causing all of these problems right it's not just knowing evil right the satanic system of the knowledge of good and evil completely redesigns the mind. It erases the image of God in our mind and it replaces it with the image of the beast, the serpent of the field. Right? We don't just think good and evil, we live it, we govern by it, we teach it in our schools, we teach it in our churches, we teach it to our children, we learn it. Every facet of society is governed by it. And worst of all, we project it onto God and say that he rules by it, making God a God of iniquity, a God of violence, and a God of murder. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 5. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 5 says this. Thus saith the Lord, what iniquity have your fathers found in me that I, they are gone far from me and have walked after vanity and are become vain? This is actually proof that we project iniquity onto God. This is proof that we project Satan's system of good and evil upon God. Because it says that when we find iniquity in God, which is bitterness, hatred, violence, and murder, it says that we run from him. And this is exactly what happened with Adam and Eve. They ran from him because they now viewed God as both good and evil. You know, we do exactly the same thing. We sin. We are the evil in Satan's system. We don't think God is going to punish us and destroy us. So we run from him because we're projecting iniquity onto him. But that's not how God is. 2 Corinthians 11.2 2 Corinthians 11.2 says this, For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Hear this part. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent 
beguiled Eve through his subtlety. So your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Paul is warning us not to let the bewitching lies of Satan and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil draw us away from the simple truth of God in Jesus. It's very simple. If you see me, you have seen the Father. That's how simple it is. And Paul's warning us, don't let the knowledge of good and evil draw you away from the simplicity of if you see me, you have seen the Father. Yet we don't believe this simple truth. We don't believe if you see me, you see the Father. We're still blinded by Satan. Ephesians 6.12 Ephesians 6.12 says this, check this out. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness, against this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We are not wrestling against flesh and blood. We're not wrestling against other people. We're not wrestling against homosexuals. We're not wrestling against Freemasons. We're not wrestling against NASA and the fake satanic agenda to keep us blinded about God's true creation. We are wrestling against the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is implanted in our minds. And it's not until this is stripped away by the beauty and excellency of the life of Christ will we ever believe the truth about God's nonviolent character. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 says this, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Once we have an understanding of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we can see that this is the great adversary that is taking place in the mind. It's these highly exalted thoughts and imaginations that are not true about God, that are embedded in our minds, that need to come down through the revelation of the life of Christ. All of our false ideas about God, which come from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they need to come down. That can only happen when we behold the beauty and excellency of agape in the nonviolent character of God revealed in the life of Jesus. 2 Corinthians 3.13 This knowledge of the tree of good and evil actually blinds us as we read the Bible. This is what it says right here. 2 Corinthians 3.13 and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadily look to the end of that which is abolished, but their minds were blinded. For until this day remains the same veil, untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. Even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon the mind. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. The veil that blinds us to the truth about God when we're reading the Old Testament is Satan's lies found in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This veil is taken away in Christ because the life of Christ reveals what the Father is actually like. There's a lot of stuff in the Old Testament that can seem like God is a killer, that he has violence, that he rewards and he punishes. Well, let's read Peter, 2 Peter 1.20. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20. Almost, almost, almost. 
2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not of old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. The Bible was not written by God himself. That sounds harsh. It says, holy men of God wrote as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. God, who at different times and in different ways spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, by whom he appointed heir of all things, by whom he also made the worlds. God speaks to us in one way, to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us directly through the Son. And as we look at the Bible, we understand that the Bible was written by men, using their own words at different times, in different ways, with different backgrounds, from different cultures, with different understandings about God. And to some degree, either a greater degree or a lesser degree, they all were influenced by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Does that mean I think that the Bible is trustable? Yes, I believe that the Bible is absolutely 100% trustable. And I think we actually need this to take place. I think we need the prophets of old to be influenced this way so that when Jesus comes, we have something to rightly divide the word of truth. The life of Christ rightly divides the word of truth. In the Bible, we have both the principles of life and the principles of death laid out side by side. We need this because in one place, the Bible, we can have all the information we need to become properly informed about both sides of the issue. Just like the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life were both in the midst of the garden, so God's principles of life and Satan's principles of death are in the same place, the Bible, so that we can make a decision, so that we can pick a side. Just like Adam and Eve had the two trees, so too we have the two trees and we have to make a choice very important that the Bible is designed this way on purpose to create within us a critical thinking mind God does not want us to be blind followers God wants to develop in our mind a critical thinking mind so that we can rightly divide the word of truth so that we don't fall for the deceptions of Satan so let's look at the Old Testament for a second Let's look and see the non-violent character of God in the Old Testament, and then let's see how Satan tries to flip things on us and project his system of iniquity onto God, and God uses different instances to shut Satan down to prove that he has a non-violent character. Job chapter 1, verse 6. Job chapter 1, verse 6 says this. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, When comest thou? Then Satan answered to the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that fears God and avoids evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge of protection around him and about his house and about all he has on every side thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land but put forth thine hand now and touch all that he has and he will curse you to your face and the Lord said unto Satan behold all that he has is in your power only upon himself put not forth thine hand so Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord and there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the asses feeding in them, and the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them away. Yes, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I, only I, am escaped. While he was yet speaking, there came another also, and said, The fire of God is fallen from heaven 
and have burned up the sheep, the servants, and consumed them, and I alone am escaped to tell thee. So fire falls from God upon Job's resources. Now who sent this fire? Did God send the fire or did Satan send the fire? Satan definitely sent the fire. Yet God gets the blame. That's important. Why did God allow this? Why didn't God stop this? It is very important. It tells us right here, Job chapter 10, verse 1. Thou hast made a hedge about him and about his house and all that he has on every side. Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. Put forth thine hand now and touch all that he has and he will curse you to your face. Satan is making an accusation to God here. Satan is saying you are using the principles of reward and punishment. That's what he's doing. And he says, Job is good only because you are using my principles. Satan says, use the punishment system and watch him curse you to your face. So God allows the character of Job to be squeezed, proving that Job does not live by the Satan system of reward and punishment. This is a revelation of the governing principles of existence. Satan is accusing God of using the very system of good and evil, knowledge of good and evil, reward and punishment. And to prove that Job does not live by this principle, God allows the character to be squeezed so that we can see what's really inside Job. And it's proven that Job lives by the tree of life. He lives by the agape laws of love. And the story of Job is not about what God or couldn't, what he could or couldn't do, right? It wasn't about God using his power to do something or not do something. It was about the principles that govern existence. Does God use Satan's principles? And the answer is no. God does not use his principles when dealing with at all. If it's angels or mankind. God never uses the satanic principles of the knowledge of good and evil. And the squeezing of Job's character proves it. The story of Job is actually a victory for the tree of life, the same way that the cross is a victory for the tree of life. It's very important. God didn't send the fire to consume Job. God didn't tell Satan to send the fire. Satan sent the fire. God gets the blame. 2 Kings chapter 1, verse 9. More fire from heaven where God gets the blame. 2 Kings chapter 1, verse 9. The king sent unto him, we're talking about Elijah and the fire coming down consuming the fifty. Then the king sent unto him a captain of fifty with his fifty, and he went up to him, and behold, he sat on the top of a hill, and he spake unto him, Thou man of God, the king hath saith come down. And Elijah answered and said to the captain of fifty, If I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. And there came down fire from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. Sounds like God sent the fire. Seems like God sent the fire because this is a man of God. No one has earthly power to send fire down upon people to kill them. What does Jesus have to say about this very event? Luke chapter 9, 52. Jesus will be the filter for this passage. Luke chapter 9, verse 52. And it came to pass, when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to Jerusalem, and sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into the village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. They did not receive him, because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples James and Jaw saw, James saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elijah did? This is the same, referencing the same story we just read in Kings. This is what Jesus says. But he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. So the spirit that sends fire from heaven to destroy men's lives is satanic. 
that's from the mouth of Jesus himself. Jesus rightly divides the Old Testament passages for us so that we can understand when God is moving and when God is not moving. So we can understand when God is moving or when Satan is moving. 1 Kings 19.11 1 Kings 19.11 Here we go. 1 Kings 19.11 says this. They're talking about Elijah. Anointing Jezreel, Jehu. And it says this. And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke the mountains and the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the fire was not, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. God is showing us time and time again that God is not in the destructive forces of nature. Satan is. How can that be? Well, the Bible explains this to us as well. As we look at the rod turning into a serpent, this isn't just God showing his power that he can change a stick into a snake. God is revealing what happens to humans, families, nations, the world, when we step out of his head, hedge of protection and we reject his authority, we reject his guidance, we reject his protection, Satan steps in and the snake, the destroyer, devours. Exodus chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Now, we've done Bible studies on all of these issues at length, topic by topic by topic. We're going through them quickly because we want to see the nonviolent character of God. If you want to see one of these things in fine details, point by point, go to the YouTube, you'll, you'll find it. The rod into a serpent. Exodus chapter 4, verse 1 through 3. And Moses answered and said, Behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice, for they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto you. And the Lord said unto him, What is in thine hand? And he said, A rod. And he said, Cast it onto the ground, and he cast it onto the ground, and it became a serpent, and Moses fled from before it. Again, the rod is a symbol for God's authority, God's guidance, God's protection, and God's power. Right? This rod is a symbol for God's heads of protection. Once we leave this heads of protection, we end up under the authority of Satan. That's what the rod turning into the serpent represents. It's not just a display of what God could do. It's an illustration for us to understand what actually happens when individuals, families, nations, even the world, leaves God's head of protection. The serpent comes to destroy and kill. Exodus chapter 12, verse 23. Exodus chapter 12, verse 23 says this. Notice this passage. Notice this. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood upon the lentil and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer, will not allow the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. God is talking about protecting people from the destroyer, who's Satan. This is what Revelation 9-11 says. Revelation 9-11. Revelation 9-11. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. Both of these names, Abaddon and Apollyon, mean destroyer. This is Satan. He's the king of the bottomless pit. He's the one that comes and destroys. And it's only through God's protection that we do not fall under the destroying hand of Satan. That is very important. The principles. Biblical principle explains scripture. Scripture explains biblical principle. God was not killing the Egyptians. Satan was. 
Check out this video about the Exodus. It explains all of this in fine detail. God saw that the hedge of protection over the Egyptians was down and he was trying to save them and he did that in the best way that he could, right? But the tree of the knowledge of good and evil makes it very difficult sometimes for us to see the love of God acting in a saving way and trying to prevent the destroyer from destroying. And it seems like God is the killer, but it's not the case. He's the savior. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that blinds our minds. God gets the blame for things that he did not do. And here's a perfect example of that. This is a perfect example of God getting the blame for something he didn't do. 1 Samuel 24. 2 Samuel 24. 2 Samuel 24. There you go. 2 Samuel 24, 1. And again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he moved against David to number them, to say, Go, number Israel and Judah. This Bible passage is how God is whispering evil in Satan's uh, in um, David's ear so that he could do something to cause the nation to come out of the heads of protection does a God of love do that this is so important to understand in one passage it says that God is doing it in another passage it says Satan is doing it first Chronicles 21 1 First Chronicles 21.1 And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. Did God move David or did Satan stand up to provoke David? Is God going to do something so that he has a, a pretext to hurt his own children? That's mental illness. That's not a God of agape. Right? We see God getting the blame for things over and over in Scripture, for things that Satan does again and again. This happens over and over for several reasons. The first reason is that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil blinds people to God's true character. In the Old Testament, over and over again, they think that God is the source of both good and evil. That's one reason. Another reason is that God would rather have a bad reputation than lose his relationship with his children. This is the nonviolent love of God, that God would rather have his relationship tarnished than uh, God would rather have his reputation tarnished than his relationship with his children broken. That's very important. Well, what about all the killing and slaughter that happened in the book of Exodus? God did not want to kill anybody. And the Bible says that. Exodus 23, 28. God did not want to kill the Canaanites. Exodus 23, 28. God did not want to kill the Canaanites. The Bible says this. Exodus 23, 28. And I will send hornets before thee, which shall drive out the Hevite and the Canaanite and the Hittite from before thee. I will not drive them out from before thee in one year, lest the land become desolate and the beasts of the field multiply against thee. God never intended any of the Canaanites, the Hittite, none of them, to be killed. God's intention was to use hornets. This is a physical reality of the spiritual truth. Right? A hornet is the symbol for the stinging in the conviction of the mind which God wanted to use to convert the Canaanites. God did not want to kill them. He wanted to convert them. Israel is the one that wanted to kill people. That's what the Bible says. Numbers 21.1. Numbers 21.1. And when the king Arad, the Canaanite, which dwelt in the south, heard that Israel came by the way of the spies, then he fought against Israel and took some of them prisoners. And Israel vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, If thou will indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. And the Lord God listened to the voice of Israel. He did not command it. He listened 
he allowed it and delivered up the Canaanites and they utterly destroyed them and they utterly destroyed them and their cities and they, he called the name of that Hormah. Israel wanted to kill. God allowed it because the Israelites would have no other way. Your family is kidnapped, some of them are killed, and the blood, thirst, and lust that's in your heart cannot be quenched, and things happen. And God understood that the children of Israel were not reasonable at this time, and he could not get through to them with love, so he allowed them to have their way. We see this over and over and over through the Bible. God dealing with hard-hearted, cold-blooded people and still using them to bring salvation to the Gentile unbelievers. Jonah chapter 3 verse 2. Jonah chapter 3 verse 2. So a Jonah rose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter the city a day's journey. And he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them, even to the least of them. For the word of the Lord came unto the king of Nineveh, and he rose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, and covered him with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed, published through Nineveh, by the decree of the king of the nobles, saying, that neither man, beast, nor herd, nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed, nor drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto the God. Yes, let them, everyone, turn from his evil and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn away from his fierce anger and we perish not? So jo Jonah goes into the city, says, 40 days the place will be overthrown. And when God prevents the satanic destruction from falling on Nineveh, Jonah gets upset. But it pleased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before you unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art gracious, merciful, slow to anger, great in kindness, and repenteth thee of the evil. And he says, Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beg thee, f my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. So Jonah is mad that God did not destroy Nineveh. Very important. Jonah 4, verses 9. And God said unto Jonah, Dost thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry, even unto death. Then said the Lord, Thou hast pity on the gourd, for which thou hast not labored, neither madest it to grow, which came up in a night, and perished not. And should not I spare Nineveh, a great city, wherein are more than a hundred and twenty thousand persons, that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle? See, God loved the Ninevites, and he wanted to save them. Same with the Egyptians, same with the Canaanites. Jonah understood God's goodness. He didn't behold it. He didn't let it change his character. And he was a cold-blooded, hard-hearted prophet of God who would rather die so that his reputation wouldn't be tarnished. And he would rather have the city be destroyed, 120,000 people killed, so that he could have a good reputation as a good prophet. It's very important that Jonah didn't understand that God did overthrow the city of Nineveh spiritually for salvation. God did not literally overthrow Nineveh for destruction. The spiritual reality is what God wanted. The same with all of us. That's what he wanted with the Canaanites. That's what he wanted with the Egyptians. This is always the reality, and it's there for us to see. Jonah is a perfect example of what God is dealing with in the Old Testament. Ignorant, hard-hearted people blinded by Satan. In the Old Testament, God was doing everything in his power to keep a connection with humanity. The whole time dealing with blind, hard-hearted, 
humans that have been infested with the knowledge of good and evil. And he allowed things to happen that he did not want to happen. He allowed things that shouldn't have happened. But God doesn't force. He doesn't manipulate. He doesn't coerce people into doing right. That's from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God does not use Satan's system. All of the evil in the Old Testament, we look at and we say that was God's will. Let us have a reality check for a moment. We look at the evil in the Old Testament and we say this is God's will. And we end up saying that God is both good and evil. And we say that we will be like this God. Revelation chapter 12 verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. The deception that Satan does in our mind is deep. He's blinded us as we read the Old Testament. We don't want to see a God of loving, tender kindness who tried to save the Egyptians, who tried to save the Canaanites, who tried to, who did save the Ninevites. We look past the fact that Jonah was a cold-blooded, hard-hearted person. But we are blinded to the truth of God's nonviolent character in the Old Testament. Right? Leviticus 19.34 shows a God of unconditional love. Leviticus 19.34. Leviticus 19.34 But the stranger that dwells with you shall be unto you as one born among you. Thou shalt love him as thyself, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. You shall do no unrighteousness in judgment when you measure a length in weight or measure in height in balances. God was calling us to mercy, truth, and unconditional love, even to those people that we didn't know and were strangers. The, the, uh, the nonviolent character of God is absolutely in the Old Testament. The question is, do we want to see it? The, do we see it? Do we see it? Do we want to see it? The Bible, especially the Old Testament, has the God that you want. If you want a God who loves, he's there. If you want a God who loves, he is there, calling his people to love, to care, to pray, to save. If you want a God who kills, he is there too. But the God in the Old Testament who kills is Satan. That is not the one true God. The choice is yours. You choose this day whom you will serve, the God of death and destruction or the God of eternal life and agape love. Very important. When we look at the Old Testament, we see this, God's anger, God's wrath, God's judgment, God's justice, God's vengeance. We've done YouTube videos on each one of these in fine detail. You want to look at these, go ahead and look at it. God's anger, God's wrath, God's judgment, God's justice, God's vengeance. If you filter these passages through the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will find a God with emotions of sinful man who kills. But this is what the Bible says. Psalm 50, verse 21. Psalm 50, verse 21. These things hast thou done, and I kept silent. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such as one as thyself, but I will reprove thee and set them in order before your face. We think God is like us. He is not like us. Isaiah 55, 8. For, your thoughts are, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. God's ways are righteous, they're loving, they're heavenly. Our ways are worldly, they're sinful, they're selfish. 
And if you filter God's anger, his wrath, his judgment, his justice, his vengeance through Jesus Christ, through the tree of life, through the righteousness of heaven, what you end up seeing in God's anger, his wrath, his judgment, his justice, and his vengeance is that you end up seeing the plan of salvation played out as God deals with sinful humanity's free will. That's exactly what you see. We've done Bible studies on it plenty for years. And what we ended up seeing was that God's anger, his wrath, his judgment, his justice, and his vengeance was that God was allowing man to have his sinful way. That was anger. And what we saw was God allowing the consequences of sin to play out. That was wrath. And what we've seen was that God brings man to a point where his sins cause him to wake up to see the truth of the situation that he caused upon himself. That was God's judgment. And then we see God showing mercy. That was God's justice. And then we see God taking vengeance on the sin that keeps the child in bondage. God doesn't take vengeance on the children. He takes vengeance on the sin. And actually, this is the plan of salvation played out in the lives of sinful man in the Old Testament as God is dealing with their free will. So God's anger, God's wrath, God's judgment, God's justice, God's vengeance. It's simply just the plan of salvation as God deals with mankind's free will. So God's nonviolent character is revealed actually throughout the entire Bible, even into the book of Revelation. So let's look at something in Revelation, and we're going to see how silly it is to look at certain passages and see God destroying by the terminology that God gives us. Revelation 6, 15 and 16. Now this is never what I belittle anything in Scripture, but when we come to this passage with the with the eyes the eye salve and the spirit guiding us and we see what it actually says and we look at the situation taking place we find that this reaction is actually very silly and it shows the ignorance of the minds of mankind revelation chapter 6 verse 15 and the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. So we see rich men and all the people in the power and all, at the end of time all the evil of the world who have chosen the false second coming and the entire uh, Mark of the Beast system. They're hiding from the wrath of the Lamb. Right? And we've been so conditioned to think that the wrath of God, the wrath of the Lamb is killing and destruction. But what is a lamb really? A lamb is a baby sheep. This represents the character of Christ. There is no violence in a baby sheep. It's not possible. Right? And the people in Revelation at the end of the time are saying, hide us from the wrath of the one who has the character like a baby sheep. It's, it's not, I'm not being disrespectful. I'm just showing the blindness that the lives of Satan in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil do to our minds. You can't hide from the wrath of the baby sheep. And when you look at what the wrath of the lamb actually is, it's the wrath of the lamb is redemptive. It's not condemning, it's redemption because the lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. It's the blindness of the mind that causes us to look at the Lamb of God as coming to destroy. The wrath of the Lamb is restoration. It's not destruction. But the minds of the people have been blinded. Revelation 5.5 5. Revelation 5.5 5, And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah the root of David hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Two lions in the Bible. This revelation is about the great controversy. One lion protects, one lion devours. The lion that protects is Jesus, the lion that devours is Satan. What kind of lion is Jesus? He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. Rev uh, Genesis 49.9 
Genesis 49 9 says this Judah is a lion's whelp now this is a reality is that Judah is a lion's cub Judah is a baby lion and Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah that means Jesus is symbolically represented as a lion that doesn't kill right lion cubs are not scary they actually draw people to them and this is exactly what Jesus is, does the truth about Jesus draws us to him a young energetic lion that we are drawn to so that we can receive protection Satan is the lion that destroys not Jesus very important Revelation 18 2 to 5 last one this is the last last verse Revelation 8 Revelation 8 2 to 5 Revelation chapter 8 Revelation 8, 2 to 5. And I saw seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, at the altar, having a golden censer. Oh, that's important. And there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came up with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar and cast it to the earth and there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake is this proof of God sending fire to destroy no Isaiah chapter 1 verse Isaiah 1 1 the vision of Isaiah son of Amos which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah Jotham Hezekiah and the kings of Judah. I'm sorry, that's the wrong wrong chapter. Isaiah chapter six, verse one. In the year that Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And it stood the seraphims, each one six wings, and with two covered his face, and with two covered his feet, and with two he did fly. And one cried and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of the people of certain of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he said, and he laid it upon my mouth and said, This hath touched thy lips, thine iniquity is taken away, thy sin is purged. Line upon line, line upon line, precept upon precept. In Revelation chapter 8, is God commanding angels to send fire to destroy? Or is he symbolically sending the fire of repentance, of healing, of forgiveness? The nonviolent character of God is a reality. And you can find it in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Do we, do we see it? If we see it, do we believe it? Adam and Eve, when they sinned, they had limited knowledge and experience with God. And when Satan said God is both good and evil, they believed him. We also have limited knowledge and experience with God. But what we have is an advantage. What we have is an advantage of 6,000 years of seeing Satan's lies played out in this earth and how they bring nothing but pain, sorrow, degradation, and death. Even though our experience and knowledge of God is limited, when Satan says to us that God is both good and evil, do not believe him. He is a liar and he is the source of all death. John 14, 9, if you see me, you see the Father. When you see my nonviolent character, you're seeing God's nonviolent character. God, the Bible says that in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. God sent forth his son 
to give us the truth, to show us the truth, what God is actually like, perfect, unchangeable love. When we break the knowledge of the tree of the good, when Jesus breaks the knowledge of the tree of the good and of the knowledge of good and evil in our minds, then we can see God for who he truly is, a nonviolent being, non being that we can love and trust enough to let him save us. But it's not until we believe the revelation of God in the life of Christ will that tree of knowledge of good and evil be broken from our minds. When you believe Jesus, when he says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father, and you eat the words of life, you're eating from the tree of life itself. I don't have some special gift. I believe Jesus. I eat from the tree of life, and I reject the lies of Satan. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it has infested everything this planet has ever touched. It's only Christ, the fruit of the Spirit, the incorruptible seed, the Spirit of God working in our minds, guiding us through all truth, can Satan's lies be destroyed. Trust the revelation of Christ. Believe the revelation of Christ that God has a non-violent character. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we bless you for your love towards us and your gentle hand of goodness that is revealed to us from Genesis to Revelation. There is none like you, a God of love, a God of patience, a God of mercy, a God of healing, of restoration. A God who waited 6,000 years and in the sixth day you created man in your image and in the 6,000th year you recreated man in your image. Thank you for that gift. Thank you for the blessing of Jesus and the truth of your word that proves that you don't use force, manipulation, violence, or coercion. Heavenly Father, break the strongholds and false ideas we have about you that is rooted in us through the tree of life. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your grace, mercy, and can please, Lord, continue to hold back the winds of strife until this tree is completely rooted out of us and we are completely shaped and molded in your character, methods, and principles of agape. Pour your spirit as a river into us and out of us. In Jesus' name, amen. I love y'all. God bless y'all.